Namaste, everyone. We're back here with another episode of In Conversation With, and we have a very special guest with us. He is among the senior most disciples of Grandmaster Chokok Sui. He is known for his clarity, his wit, and brilliance. He is much loved and respected globally. You should have guessed by now. Drum roll, please. Welcome, Acharya Dani. There's a huge amount of interest in people talking about astral travel. They're talking about chakras, they're talking about energies and vibes. And, and the amazing part is that it's now in popular culture as well. Like if you look at the current crop of movies, uh, you had Dr. Strange looking for the ancient one and, you know, he talked about the chakras and I'm, I'm assuming that most of us, you know, who have been studying got a real kick out of the fact that the Wi-Fi password was Shambhala. I mean, I definitely clocked that. And uh, <laughs> I just would like to request you to explain what Shambhala actually is. Okay, so uh, that's a good password, by the way. You, you can pop it <laughs> because everyone knows by now. <laughs> that's the password of, um, what's the name of that place? Kamartaj. Yes. Now, Shambhala is uh, actually a mystical kingdom. It, it's a, it's, it's a, a fantasy kingdom. Uh, and this is found in the, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, particularly the Tibetan Buddhists. So according to the legend, the legend of Shambhala, uh, uh, there's supposed to be this mystical kingdom in the mountains where you have uh, the, the Lord Maitreya, who is the next Buddha, uh, as, as the ruler. And uh, the Lord Maitreya is sort of accumulating and training and developing uh, uh, people, uh, souls, who will become the forces of good and developing and training the army. So it's like there's this hidden kingdom in the mountains with an army of do-gooders. And they are preparing for the time when the world is going to uh, sink into chaos, into war, into greed. And, and when, when it does that, when the world uh, starts to, to uh, uh, balance itself on the edge of extinction, you know, like you're, you're almost going to destroy, the whole world's about to come to an end. That's when the forces of good from Shambhala, they're supposed to come out. They're supposed to defeat the forces of evil and bring about a new golden age. Wow. Uh, that would, this golden age would cover not just uh, that particular kingdom, but the, the whole world. So it's like they're the, they're the saviors. Uh, they're preparing for the time when the world might, might uh, get destroyed by, by, by evil. So, this is in the Buddhist uh, tradition, and and they have they have uh, uh, they have additional stories that it's not just the Lord Maitreya in the Buddhist tradition that's going to come from Shambhala. They say even the, the the one of the last incarnations of Lord Vishnu, I think fourth or fifth incarnation of Lord Vishnu, is going to come from Shambhala. So you have you have the Hindu uh, uh, system uh, in the form of the Lord Vishnu. Um, being mixed in with the with the, the legend of, of of Shambhala, so you have both Hindu and Buddhist traditions uh, installed there. Now, but uh, in the esoteric tradition, uh, Shambhala is uh, not exactly a physical place. You see, in the legend, they say this 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 uh, mystical kingdom in the in, in the mountains. It's somewhere in the Himalayas. Uh, it's easy to get him less because it's inaccessible and therefore nobody can disprove it no? because nobody can go. But there were actually expeditions that were sent out to try to discover whether this place actually exists. And some of the expeditions were led by spiritual people. Uh, 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 and of course, uh, none of them uh, found it. Uh, in, in some of the theosophy books, they say Shambhala is on the northern side of the Himalayas and the northern slopes and later on, they say it's in the Gobi Desert, uh, Gobi Desert in Mongolia, no? not, not to Gobi the, the dish. <laughs> so, uh, 
because some of you are from India, you yes. know what Gobi yes. means. Now. We suddenly thought so, about it now. <laughs> so you have the the uh, the legend legend identifying a physical place, but in the esoteric tradition, it's not actually a physical place. They say the uh, Shambhala actually exists in another dimension in the etheric plane or in the astral plane. That means you cannot identify it, you cannot see it in the physical material world because it is in the, in the upper levels uh, of the physical plane, in the etheric plane and in the astral plane. Now, uh, what is it? It is a place where uh, you have the headquarters where, where there's a congregation of all the great spiritual beings. When they're not working, uh, or even if they're working, because they probably have been doing online activities before <laughs> online activities were intended. <laughs> so you have a place, I don't know if it's actually a place, but well, it's more like to identify a certain area where you have a congregation of all the great spiritual beings that are looking after the good of humanity. They're looking after the welfare of life on this planet, life on earth. So. Uh, in the Christian tradition, they refer to the, the, the communion of saints. And, and even the Bible uh, mentions 24 spiritual elders. You have this in the Jain tradition, the Tirtankaras. Uh, you have the, uh, I think in the Hindu tradition, I don't know, they're called Maharishis or, or, or uh, avatars. Or, or There are many terms for, for them depending on the culture. But in short, you have these, uh, and there's supposed to be more than 24. There's supposed to be this con uh, congregation of so many spiritual beings. And the place where they are is called Shambhala. Now, uh, the head uh, at the top, you have this spiritual hierarchy, which formed the spiritual government for the whole world. At the, at the top, you have, you have the, the Lord of the world. And one okay. They, they have many names. Uh, this, this being has many names. One one title that is given is Sanat Kumara, and uh, he has. Uh, I mean, this great being has three assistants. They have the three Kumaras, obviously. You know, uh, they're all Kumaras, and so from these four, below them you would have the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, and all the initiates that form the spiritual hierarchy of the world. So if all of them are there. All of the Shambhala becomes like the, the headquarters. Now, this spiritual hierarchy in the in in some of the, the books written in the 19th century, uh, this spiritual hierarchy they were referred to as the, the great white brotherhood, which of course now may not have uh, may not be that politically correct, no, but that was the terminology available to them at that time. And many of the spiritual teachers that came out. In the 19th century, you have Madame Blavatsky, you have Gurdje, and then later on, uh, you have Torpom Saraydarian. At one time or another, they were identified as disciples of, of uh, uh, spiritual teachers who are part of this, this uh, spiritual hierarchy, part of the, the great white uh, uh, brotherhood. Now, uh, and, and, and some people either uh, claim, have, have even claimed that Yes, uh, I am. I am a disciple. My teacher is part of the the Great White uh, Brotherhood. Some even claim I am um, yes. a member. <laughs> yeah, I'm not just a disciple. And and you have all this, uh, you know, um, what we call this uh, spitting contest to see who 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 is the better connected. But anyway, uh, you have all these other uh, interesting stories that surround it. But in essence. Shambhala is occupied by the spiritual hierarchy, the great spiritual beings. But it's, I mean, these great spiritual beings, some of them are so huge that they cover the whole world. So they don't really have, they don't really occupy a particular space, as in have a, 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 have a, or a responsibility over a specific area, a specific uh, field uh, regarding the world. So, uh, and, and, uh, Shambhala, because it is where these great spiritual beings congregate, becomes uh, a planetary center. So they say it is a planetary center, meaning it's a planetary chakra. And it is presumably, uh, or arguably, the, the crown chakra of the world. So if, if a human being has a crown chakra, and if the, the planet Earth 
uh, was a living thing, then the crown chakra of the planet Earth would be Shambhala. Uh, so Shambhala is not just a place, it is an energy center, it's an, it's, there's an energy vortex. Now, either it's an energy vortex by itself, and that's the reason why the higher beings, the great spiritual beings, congregated there, or maybe because they're there, it has become an, uh, a crown chakra, it has become an energy center. So uh, either one is probably the case, I would not be able to uh, give any, uh, how do you say, correct answer to this, uh, not, not, not being able, it's a difficult thing to, to verify and to validate. But according to the books, uh, the esoteric book, they say Shambhala is a planetary center. And uh, this is connected with uh, the special meditation occasions. So, uh, for example, during uh, special full moon festivals, the, uh, not the Kumaras, but the, the Buddha, who is like the highest uh, uh, from among the human, from among those who evolved from the human world, uh, the Lord Buddha would bring energy from Shambhala, but of course this energy comes from God through the spiritual world and through Shambhala onto the earth. So the, just like for a human being, the crown chakra would bring energy to the whole system, to all the other chakras, to the physical body, as well as to the subtle bodies. So there are certain meditations that are uh, appropriate uh, to be done in order to, to uh, how do you say, sync, to synchronize with what is going on in the inner world, what is going on between the energy from Shambhala as it descends into planet Earth. Now, it doesn't happen all the time. There's only special times of the year when you have a full on dose of spiritual energy from Shambhala coming down to the planet Earth. Uh, facilitated, of course, by the great spiritual beings that are in charge of the evolution of life on Earth. So <clears throat> uh, Shambhala uh, is, uh, it, th there's a, a, a Buddhist tradition connected with it. It's a mystical kingdom according to the Buddhist tradition. Uh, in the esoteric tradition, it is more than the mystical kingdom. It is, um, it is where great spiritual beings uh, congregate or are found, or, or that's what they call their home, or it's a place where they, they, they focus their energies. Uh, it's, it's, it's also uh, a planetary center, uh, an energy center, uh, a vortex of energy for the whole, for the whole world. And of course, uh, for those of you who are, many of you are familiar with the chakras, no? If a human being has like many chakras, then you can imagine uh, a greater uh, living entity like the planet Earth would probably have more, uh, even more chakras you know, than, than, than human beings. The same way that we as human beings have more chakras than let's say a, a, a lower uh, order of creatures like, like the insects and, that, uh, and, and the animals. So uh, you have that, uh, in, in the background. Now, um, so I hope this, this answers uh, some of the questions on Shambhala. It's not a place you can go to, but it's a place you can tap into. You can uh, tap into the energies that come from Shambhala, but it is at specific times of the year only, it's not, it's not on all the time. Unless you have a connection with one of the great spiritual teachers who are staying in Shambhala. So that actually answers uh, one of the questions that was going on in my head. I'm sure someone or the other who's looking, how do I get to Shambhala? Practice very hard <laughs> is one of the answers, basically. Practice, 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 maybe in another lifetime. But, uh, and also the fact that I don't think I'm gonna look at Gobi the same way again. Um, but uh, since we're talking about legends and I, I love the way that you put this whole, uh, explain the, the history of Shambhala and you know the, the energy aspect of it as well. And there's one more legend that we would like to ask you. And that is uh, the legend of Wesak and the Wesak Valley. 
uh, the legend connected to Wesak. So if you could let us and the viewers uh, know yes. about Wesak. So the Wesak is uh, supposed to be the uh, full moon of the month of May. And this was celebrated uh, as in the in, in the in the Western uh, sorry in the esoteric tradition. This was celebrated uh, as one of the three uh, full moon festivals of the world, as we mentioned earlier, where you have a great concentration of energies coming down to earth from God, passing through the Shambhala. Uh, then being distributed by the spiritual hierarchy to their disciples. So uh, the three uh, important full moons of the year would be the full moon of Aries, uh, which is between March and April. You have the full moon of Taurus, which is between uh, April and, and May. And then you have the full moon of Gemini, which is between May and uh, June. So you have 12 full moons in a year because we have 12 months. No? And all, each one of these full moon uh, occasions would bring a tremendous amount of energy down to earth. And there's a scientific explanation for this. Uh, they say on, on the day of the full moon or night or whichever way you want to look at it, uh, or at the time of the full moon, the earth receives the usual uh, sunlight from the sun. But in addition to the sunlight from the sun, the earth receives an additional dose of sunlight coming from the moon. Actually, it's not coming from the moon, it's being reflected by the moon. Uh, it originally comes from the sun and the moon reflects it to earth. So on the full moon day, the earth gets uh, not really twice as much energy, but a little bit more energy than on other days of the month. So these energies coming now down to earth, uh, moving now into the esoteric tradition, they say these energies, not necessarily sunlight, but these energies coming from the sun, including the part that's diverted from the sun to the moon before it goes to earth. These energies magnify our thoughts and emotions. And because of this, it is an auspicious time to meditate during the full moon or to do things that bring forth from the person positive thoughts and positive emotions. So when you have when you, when you produce from within you positive thoughts and positive emotions during the day of the full moon, these are magnified and it, you become better for it. From the perspective of the, the third reason why we meditate, it helps you evolve faster. It helps you evolve faster because like uh, it's different from any other day of the month because here you have an overabundance of positive thoughts and positive emotions giving every single person, every single one of us, an opportunity to get a leg up uh, in term, in, in, on the path of improving themselves. They're able to advance themselves a little bit more uh, than before, you know, than, than on other days of the, of the month. Now, uh, but on these three full moons, the full moon of Aries, the full moon of Taurus, and the full moon of Gemini, on these three full moons, you have additional energy, not just the sun and moon energy, you have the additional energy from Shambhala, from the great spiritual teachers. So they say the festival of Aries, the full moon of Aries, uh, they also call it the, the uh, festival of the Christ. This is when uh, the Lord Christ, which is, by the way, a, a title uh, given to a particular uh, great spiritual being, the, the energy of the Christ comes down to earth during the festival of Aries, uh, the full moon of Aries. And that is distributed throughout the world by the spiritual hierarchy with the disciples of the spiritual hierarchy assisting them in distributing said energy throughout the world. Now, the second full moon, full moon of Taurus, it is no longer the Christ that comes down, it is the Lord Buddha comes down. And when we say comes down means, you know, from the whatever dimension the Shambhala is in, uh, these great beings who are beyond the, 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 the physical, the etheric, and the astral plane. Now, if you're familiar with the, the, the different planes of existence, uh, the Lord Buddha is way, way, way beyond uh, the astral plane. But at the time of the Taurus full moon, the Lord Buddha comes down, uh, brings, uh, more accurately, brings the energy. The Lord Buddha brings his energy down 
as close as possible to Earth. So they say upon, uh, it touches on the etheric plane of the Earth. And from there, that energy can be uh, more easily uh, transmitted, less garbled, uh, less interruption, you know, less disruption. This energy gets transferred to the uh, members of the spiritual hierarchy, to their disciples, and to the men and women of goodwill throughout the uh, planet Earth. So, because there's uh, less uh, disruption and there's less dilution of the energy, it's, it doesn't get diluted by going passing through the mental plane, and the astral plane, and the etheric. You know. So, it's already there in the etheric plane. So, it makes it easier to come down to the uh, physical world. Now, uh, Wesak is the most powerful of the three meditations, of the three full moon, rather. And the three full moon are more powerful than the other uh, nine. So these are the auspicious times when we should do uh, spiritual meditation because not only do we get uh, an extremely huge quantity of prana and subtle energy from the meditation and from our teacher, we're also getting additional energy from the sun, from the moon, from Shambhala, from Lord Buddha on uh, during the full moon of Taurus. So it's an auspicious time. It's one of the best times of the year to recharge, to get as much energy as you can from the meditation so that you sort of uh, uh, get a spark, get, a, get an impetus to continue your evolution, to continue developing, to continue growing. You need this additional energy. So once a year, we all get this opportunity to get this, this energy that sort of jump starts us, uh, hopefully uh, sustains us for the next uh, eight, uh, nine months. Uh, and then the cycle repeats itself uh, every year. So Wesak is considered a, a, a most auspicious time uh, to do the meditation because Wesak happens on the full moon of, of Taurus. And now uh, here, there is, here is where you have some, some uh, confusion because in the mainstream Buddhist community, they celebrate Wesak on the full moon of the month of May. And the full moon on the month of May may fall anywhere from May 1 to May 30th or 31st. 31st. So anytime between May 1st and the end of May, anytime there's a full moon there, that's the Wesak uh, full moon. So this is the, uh, and this is good. Uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with this. But in the esoteric tradition, they follow Wesak or they celebrate Wesak on the full moon of Taurus. And so those of us who are familiar with uh, astrology, you know, you know your sign. Uh, you know the Taurus starts from mid-April, around April 22 to uh, May 22. So this year, the full moon of Taurus falls on April 27. So April 27 now, it's not May, but it's April. April 27 now for the esoteric groups, for the spiritual groups. They uh, uh, do the Wesak meditation on this day. April 27. Now, the mainstream Buddhist community, they do the, they celebrate the Wesak in May 26 or May 27, which is the full moon of the month of May. So there's a, there's a difference between how uh, Wesak or when Wesak is celebrated by mainstream Buddhist community and when it is celebrated by the esoteric groups. So Master Choa being uh, himself a student of uh, esoteric uh, sciences, and a teacher of esoteric sciences, he follows the, the schedule of the esoteric group. So uh, we do the same thing. So we celebrate the Wesak on the full moon of Taurus. And for me, this has greater significance because the full moon of, uh, of Taurus, Taurus is, is a symbol for willpower because the bull, no? Taurus is the bull. And the bull symbolizes will, symbolizes power. And this is the energy that we all need uh, to evolve, to, to move on, to, to upgrade ourselves, to, to raise our levels, to level up, uh, as they say in this, uh, in this video games. No? So uh, you, you need uh, this, you see the willpower uh, is like rajasic energy, it is the dynamic energy, it's the energy that pushes forward. So if you want to evolve, you need to push forward. And the will energy from the bull, from Taurus, is uh, of 
significance in this whole scheme. No? So that's why for me, I feel the full moon of Taurus is the better uh, uh, day to celebrate Wesa. We as pranic healers, and also actually a lot of non-pranic healers are going to be watching this and practicing the meditation on Twin Hearts. Um, we, you know, like you said, it's good to meditate. But why do we do this specific meditation on Twin Hearts, um, on Vesak and on the full moon? I mean, we know that the meditation on Twin Hearts has many, many benefits, you know, mentally, emotionally, physically. You, you've talked about that. But spiritually, why, what is the significance of doing Twin Hearts meditation, one on the full moon and one on um, Vesak specifically, if you could let us know? Yes, well, um, there are many good reasons. One, uh, one among them uh, immediately can think of is that when you do Twin Hearts, you are based on the words that Kan uh, Mahacho use, uses in, in guiding us in, through the meditation. You're producing positive thoughts, positive emotions. You're blessing the world with love, with peace, with goodwill for all mankind, uh, uh, sorry, humankind. Uh, you're, you're blessing uh, the world with lots of good thoughts and good emotions. And on Wesak Day, uh, as with what would happen with other full moon uh, days, these are the positive energies that are magnified by the full moon energies. And, and that's why it's a good idea to do Twin Hearts. Now, second, the technique of Twin Hearts involves blessing the world, raising your hands uh, with the palms facing forward, and then you imagine the earth in front of you, and these positive energies, positive thoughts and positive emotions within you, you are blessing to the whole world. So the meditation on Twin Hearts enables us, allows us to share the energy of Westa with the whole world, which is the main idea in the first place. So we don't just receive the energy for ourselves and then go home, you know, we receive the energy and distribute it around the world. Because the people who who need the energy the most, especially the Wesa energy with the full moon of Taurus, uh, the energy of the Lord Buddha, the energy, the energy of will from the Taurus uh, aspect of the uh, astrology. Now, the people who need this energy the most are the people who are trying to, to affect positive change in the world. These are the people who need energy because they're up against they're up against a tough opponent. They're up against the inertia. They're up against the laziness of all the people, including their own laziness. So it's like trying to roll, roll a, a stone uphill. So they need, they need the energy the most. And how do we get the energy to all these people? And the technique in meditation twin hearts, which is the blessing aspect, allows us the opportunity to do this. We're able to bless every uh, everyone on earth, and in fact, we do bless everyone on earth with special emphasis to these people who are trying their best to make the world a better place to live in. So you can bless all the frontliners, uh, all the people who are trying to affect positive change, all the people who are trying to improve, even if it's just their own lives or their own families. And they need that energy. And many of them do not even know this meditation, do not even know about Vesa. So uh, as practitioners, uh, as students of, of, of Master Choa, as practitioners of these uh, teachings, we do Twin Hearts meditation because it's the most appropriate meditation that helps us bless out and distribute the energy of Wesa to the whole world, to everyone. And there's uh, uh, one uh, uh, last, but probably not the least, and probably not the last uh, explanation also, but uh, the, the Twin Hearts meditation involves uh, the technique involves activating the heart and the crown chakras, which are twin uh, chakras, meaning they are, they, they are replica of each other. Now, but our crown chakra, as we mentioned earlier, uh, is like the Shambhala of the human being. The Shambhala, our Shambhala center, that could be another term we use for crown chakra. Our Shambhala center is the crown chakra. It is the center through which spiritual energy enters the physical body. So the crown chakra, resonates with Shambhala more than any other chakra uh, that we have. So, uh, and this is the reason why since ancient times, since the inception and this and, uh, invention of, of, of meditation, a special emphasis of, has always been placed on the crown chakra, the Sahasrara. You meditate on the Sahasrara, you become one with God, etc. Of course, it's a 
shortcut explanation. There's actually a lot of other things that happen uh, in between. But more or less, you get the idea that when you develop the crown chakra, it resonates well with Shambhala. Uh, you're able to, maybe not immediately, but at some point in time in your spiritual development, maybe you will be able to tap in and connect to Shambhala much more easily. Uh, of course, the process is greatly facilitated by the spiritual teacher. So uh, uh, you have to find a really good spiritual teacher like uh, Grandma Sacha also. I completely agree. The meditation on Twin Hearts, um, I think is a lot of people's personal favorite, um, just for the fact that you become a blessing, you become a part of uh, the divine plan. And, you know, if people wanted to find out, you know, I want to go to Shambhala, I want to go to the Vesak Valley, all of that, you just need to meditate and you kind of tap in. So I think this whole, uh, I mean, considering I've been meditating for some time, of course, not as much as you, but it just has inspired me to think about the whole thing in a different way. And I know that whoever is watching um, has been inspired, I mean, to really, really practice and go ahead because, you know, there's so many places that we need to go. I mean, internally, like Shambhala and of course, some people, the lucky ones, go to the Wesak Valley if they're entitled to. But for all of this knowledge, for all the understanding that you've given us right now, um, I don't know if we can repay it, but one thing I know that all of us can do is actually meditate every day. And you have really, really inspired us to do so. So a big thank you from all of us because uh, it is always a pleasure to sit with you and to learn from you. And I think I, I talk on behalf of the entire team. We're so grateful and so happy that you spent time with us today to, you know, to explain things. And um, of course, uh, you know, we will come back for some more teachings <laughs> if you would let us and hopefully you are yes. trying to get rid of us. <laughs> but we just would like to thank you from everyone who is watching uh, from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much.